Well, hello, I'm Larry Ward. Pronouns he and his and him. Greetings to you. I know this is a very difficult moment. The fires of grief are burning all around us. It is a continuation of the retribution of America's racial karma. This 500 year legacy of tragedy has not escaped me. I started a poem, it's not finished yet, but uh, I suspect it will show up in the book. So I'll give you where I, where I am so far. Innocent suffering still flowing. Perpetrators showered with fame and silent applause. Slave catchers still live. It is why we run. To say I didn't do it in the whispers of your mind is an indication of your culpability. To say that someone, it was not me, when in fact it was you, animating every move with your quiet permission. Commission is the same as omission. There is no hiding place down here. So I'm sure more will emerge um, as I continue to uh, work on this book. I've been telling some close friends that uh, it was much easier doing a dissertation for me than it was to write this book on America's racial karma because my journey into writing it put me back in touch with vast, the vast ocean of trauma, uh, both within me and around me and throughout uh, history. I found a great phrase from uh, Oscar Wilde um, that I added a little bit to. We live in the land of sorrow. And uh, Oscar Wilde's great phrase is, where there is sorrow, there is holy ground. We must understand our sorrow as divine energy and not simply um, a political error. We must understand our suffering profoundly. The gate of ancestral grief is being flooded in all of us. Uh, I, 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 I made a note for myself every day since I've been working on this book, focus in a focused way in the last six to seven months, a year. I scan the world every day looking for news. And I notice I keep looking for news in which one day I will not discover some person of color, some person of gender expansiveness is not being destroyed. Hmm. I have not yet had that day. And so my practice is to help me deal with the disappointment, the frustration, the fatigue, the anxiety, the overwhelm, the panic, the hypervigilance. So notice in yourself how all the events of the most recent months of people being murdered has affected you, your nervous system, not just your thoughts, but how has your body been responding? Have you noticed your own hypervigilance? Have you noticed your own fatigue? Have you noticed your own sense of overwhelm or, or panic or even hopelessness? I got a note from someone who said, I'm seriously considering leaving the country. So all these issues, all these feelings, all these sensations rise in us, but also shame rises in us. And it's the shame of not being valued as a human being. And it's the shame of the experience of not being worthy of love. So our work, my work with my experience of the pain of 500 years most recently, yesterday I spent a day in silence for George Floyd. 
Um, I found it uh, healing is one of the ways I practice with my own trauma is to let it be, not try to fix it. Trauma must be respected because it is part of our precious humanness. This experience of wanting to fight or flee or this numbness you may experience, this paralysis of not knowing what to do is our biological system in action. There, it is normal. There is nothing wrong. In fact, you might say something is right if we are experiencing this fear, this anger, this numbness, this heartbreak. So I've been, um, I use poetry to practice when, uh, to resource myself, other people's poetry. I dabble in writing poetry. Um, I sit out, I spend as much time as I can outside of the four walls of this house. So I spend time with the birds, uh, which we have a lot here, um, chatting with them every morning and, and every evening. And with the sunrise, I'm out feeling the warmth of the sun and with the moonlight. I'm, so look, it's a very important not to understand simply as human defined. We must understand ourselves as nature defined. And when we understand ourselves that way, we can touch our generativity. We can touch our resilience that is in fact beyond time and space. Singing, music, dance, movement, all of these are ancient practices from our ancestors that many of us have forgotten The birds remind me of that. And when we think of ancestors, please remember our greatest ancestor, Mother Earth. She is, is filled with energies that can help us heal. She is filled with equanimity that holds us together on this planet. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a poem after a bombing that happened in Vietnam, a bombing, of course, by Americans. I hold my face in my two hands. No, I am not crying. I hold my face in my two hands to keep my loneliness warm. Two hands protecting, two hands nourishing, two hands preventing my soul from leaving me in anger. And it's very important here to understand the point of anger in Buddhism. The point is not anger. Anger is a normal, perfect human experience that you may and I may be having in daily life, but especially at this moment. The point of this is not to lose ourselves, not to lose our sense of oneness with ourselves, not to lose our sense of loving ourselves, not to lose our sense ourselves in fragmentation, that's the point. And it could be anger, it could be fear, it could be numbness, but the point of practice is not to lose ourselves. So we don't push away suffering. Feel every ounce of suffering through your whole body, but we don't drown in it either. And that's the great practice of my life. To me, the task before us is first of all, self-care and figuring out for yourself. You, I know you already have many ways that you figured out to care for yourself. Who would have thought that we have a pandemic worldwide and in the midst of this, this is the power for me of the pandemic has laid things bare for anybody who loved being unclear, for anybody who <laughs> is addicted to disassociation from other people's suffering and from others' pain. Yeah. I think the challenge for me, I don't know what to do about this. I'm just telling you where I'm at now. Uh, I think we have to create communities of resilience. Um, I, I, yes, I think we have to create communities of resilience. And what I mean by that is, no one in this country from the very beginning believed we could live together. 
that's our legacy. And when we see and feel what we see and feel and experience, how could it be otherwise? We started that way. This is our karma. And karma can be healed and karma can be transformed, but only if we choose to do so. This community of resilience is one of kindness, openness, generosity, sanity, and loving. And there are so many people in this land who do not believe this is possible. So for me, I haven't figured out, I know it has to be concrete, it has to be embodied so that when people encounter it, they go, oh my goodness, I didn't know experientially that this was possible. So I, I, I practiced with a couple of mantras that came back to me overnight. The first one is stand up in the house of belonging. Don't act like this is not your land. Don't act like you can't take charge because it's obvious to me that the principalities and powers who are supposed to be in charge of this land at this moment are absolutely incapable. So stand up. Act like you are a real human being. Don't let somebody define your life for you or your power for you. Take your seat at the table of healing and transformation and thinking of the words of my grandma, don't let some fool take your seat. <laughs> take, take your seat, stand up, be present, care for yourself, love yourself. Because as you love yourself and care for yourself, that love will leak out. It will spill out all around you in a fragrance of wholeness. Ride the winds of change unafraid. Act like the mighty ones of old who know, who knew no fear. Embrace their wild resilience and their vision of what is really possible for us together. Thank you.